good evening. You are listening to the Raw Silk Show. No, just kidding. This is your girl, Raw Silk, and I am sitting in for the wonderful Mr. LP, Stephen Sykes. So I'm so happy to be here this evening with my guy friend and my brother, Marcus J., and the young lady that I'm going to call Batman. Because <laughs> we had this argument offside. She don't want to be Robin. So we just going to call her my Batman. The Reverend Dr. Marquita Carmichael. My pastor, my bestie friend. So if I slip up and I say Kita, y'all will know who I'm talking about. But I'm just going to respect her and say, what's up, Doc? All's well. All's well. And Marcus J., how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. I'm honored to be here with you fine ladies this evening. So I'm looking forward to a evening of dialogue a building and uh i'm ready to rock and roll here yeah i'm definitely definitely ready rock and roll and you know i definitely want to first thank um steven for giving me this opportunity to fill his um converses so to speak so <laughs> we thank you steven and we hope you're out there listening and i hope that i do you justice so with that being said guys tonight i i, I wrestled and i prayed and i decided the thing that we're going to talk about tonight is that new jim crow is that all right because I know that we've been seeing all of the things that's been going on out there in the news, the Sandra Bland situation, Trayvon Martin situation. We just, um, not celebrated, but we just passed the year anniversary of Michael Brown. So I want to um, talk about that new Jim Crow and how it factors in um, in modern day society. I'm pulling actually from a great book um, that my pastor and doc shared with me, Michelle Alexander. It's a great book, um, The New Jim Crow, Color Blindness. So if you get an opportunity to go out there and read it, and if I did a disservice to the name, doc will correct me. But please, I, I've, I've read the study guide um, that's been out there, and it gives us a great opportunity to dialogue. That said, if you have a question or a comment or just want to join in the conversation, give us a call at 804 804- 402-2893. That's 804-402-2893. Now, for me, um, Doc and I also have our own show, The Sister to Sister Can We Talk Show on Comcast 95 and Verizon 36. I know, shameless plug. But um, for me, I always like to do research and always make myself notes. So if you hear something wrestle in the back, I'm not eating potato chips. I'm actually turning pages. <laughs> that said, I'm just going to start up by saying that with this new Jim Crow, more African Americans are under the control of the criminal justice system today in prison, jail, on probation or parole than were enslaved in 1850. Discrimination in housing, education, employment, voting rights, Things that many Americans thought was wiped out by the civil rights laws of the 1960s is now perfectly legal against anyone labeled a felon. And since many more of people of color than of my Caucasian brothers and sisters or my brown-skinned brothers and sisters are made felons by the entire system of mass incarceration, racial discrimination, it remains as powerful as it was under the slavery codes of post-slavery and the Jim Crow segregation. So that said, let's talk about the privatization of the prison system. Well, one of the concerns that I always have when we're talking about the privatization of prisons is that um, someone is making money hand over fist. And the, the problem with that is then you're not really trying to combat war on drugs. You're not trying to combat a war on crime. What you're trying to do is fill beds. And so it's not in the government's interest or even in law enforcement's interest to even put policies in place or practices in place that would curb or stem the tide of crime. So um, as long as somebody has a hand in it and somebody's getting paid, then there's no real impetus on them to try to uh, protect and serve as it was, as much as it is for them to uh, line their own pockets. And there's information and research out there, even on African Americans who are owners of or um, partners in prisons that are privatized. So even for us to even borrow the hashtag Black Lives Matter, I ask the question, Black Lives Matter to whom and for what purposes? Good point, Doc. Marcus? Well, I think we have to think about where the beginning, you know, we, got, we can go all the way back to the Constitution and look at the 13th Amendment, which, you know, to paraphrase, it means that, you know, if you do a crime, you get to be good old slave again. Mm -hmm. And everything about this country is about capitalism and it's about money. And if you look at 
the way the prison systems are set up, it's set up like slavery was set up with mm-hmm. the, you know, with the, with the slaves and the overseer and the masters and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, so there's a direct correlation to how it was in the past and how it is in the present. And then you got to remember, you know, unfortunately, I know people personally that are, you know, on that vacation right now. <laughs> to, right, right. You know what I mean? And so, I know what it costs to, to, to make a phone call. It's outrageous. Mm-hmm. I know what it costs to get a T-shirt. It's outrageous. Mm-hmm. You know, and so they gouge them. You know, they're absolutely taking advantage of them. When you take, you know, 50, you know a five-minute phone call might cost you $15, $20, you know, but you might make six cents an hour or something exactly. crazy. I don't know the figures, exactly. but you understand the point. And, and I got some exactly. numbers that I'm definitely going to share with you later, but good point. Yeah. Right? Because yeah, yeah. They're, even with the privatization, you have people that are, um, industries, you know, at one point there were telephone operators who were actually inmates. And, you know, while we're out here working every day trying to make, you know, a dollar out of 15 cents, they're making literally less than 15 cents right. to do the jobs right. that we were actually doing. And so, again, money, hand over fist. Definitely. And it, you raised a good point, Doc. Let me just share this. And, again, um, a lot of radio is about education and telling the truth. So we're going to put some facts out there, facts that come from NASDAQ, facts that come from the Department of Justice as well. I want to talk about, when you talk about money, let's talk about one company in particular, and that's CCA. And CCA stands for the Corrections Corporation of America. That's right, you heard me. The Corrections Corporation of America is the nation's largest owner of private prisons and has seen revenue climb by 500% in the last two years per NASDAQ. Last year, the company made an offer to 48 governors to buy and operate their own state-funded prisons that included a mandatory occupancy requirement, a clause in their contract that demands each state to keep their newly privatized prison at least 90% full at all times, regardless of whether the crime in that area was rising or falling. Forty-one of those contracts included occupancy requirements mandating a 80 to 100 percent full capacity. At the big private prison companies, CCA and GEO Group are the management and training corporations that also provide bedding, telephone service, and health care in the same prison. So it's like a major monopoly. States with the highest occupancy requirements are Arizona, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Virginia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Places where you have large uh, populations of African American and Latino. Border state. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Cost savings is um, uh, unbelievable. I mean, when you really think about it, okay, and we talked about this on our show. What a new game of monopoly that somebody actually has the corporation that builds the prison. Right. Then I pass the ball over to my sister who owns the linen company. Mm-hmm. She passes the ball over to her br- brother-in-law who does the food service. Mm-hmm. And then the cousin is the judge <laughs> or the exactly. police officer. Exactly. That thing goes round and round and round and round or whatever. And so then it's you're amazing. not even talking about... Um, the goal should be to have zero occupancy, right? The goal ought to be to cut down on crime and to make um, a living wage so that people who are not career criminals, but people who are out there just trying to eat and try to feed their families, trying to take care of themselves, trying to live, don't end up incarcerated. Or even even when we're looking at drugs, we're talking at small amounts of marijuana, tiny out, tiny amounts. Can where we you're talk getting about six seeds? Okay. <laughs> but even talking about these small quantities that can get you six, ten years or even more than that, right. and it is utterly ridiculous. So you're talking about filling beds for 25 years. Right. And how about the testing that they do on children, on little boys, right. in certain demographics where they determine uh, what they're going to be doing when they're 18 years old based upon what their test scores are and when right they're grade. eight. Right. You know, and, and, and they're also being tested on standardized tests that have been proven to be culturally, you know, inappropriate. Biased. Exactly. You're biased, You're you know, biased. and so, you know, it's one of those things where, when you talk about the monopoly and you talk about how everything is connected, 
that's an obvious, you know, example of how those things are connected. And then when you factor in things like stop and frisk and the over policing of certain neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have some folks walking around thinking that black people are more predisposed to violent crimes right. than other demographics, which is obviously not true. Not true. But the media can help a tremendous amount with that as well. Yeah. When all that you see on television are um, p black people right. being arrested and right. seemingly, like you said, um, more prone to violent acts. Right. I think that that's, that's amazing. The other thing to talk about is when you talked about, Doc, about money, okay, and you raised a good point when you said about the African Americans that actually own prisons, but what about some of us that have invested in private prisons and didn't even realize right. we were doing it? And we talked about this on the way coming over here. If you are a member of, if you have a 401k and your 401k is managed by the Vanguard Group or Fidelity Investments, Fidelity Investments and the Vanguard Group are America's top two 401k providers. They are also two of the private prison industry's biggest investors. Wow. Wow. I think we just really made somebody get in their feelings for just right. now. Okay. <laughs> but you, know? you have to really yeah. look at this and say, okay, so am I prepared to diversify? Am I prepared to take my money out of that company because I don't believe in their policies? And we talked about that because remember, we had the friend when we when we did this show the first time and it was right before Black Friday and we was like, okay, well, I'm not going out Black Friday and you get, girl, they have a big screen TVs on sale. Mm -hmm. I'm not, not going to go to Walmart. Mm -hmm. So again, and then think about it. They usually bring this 401k um, paperwork package to you, like in an envelope like this big, right? right? And give it to you and say, I need it back in two days. And you don't we have the time to read, go all of, no. to read all of that stuff in that little bit of fine print. Right. And it may or may not even say in that amount of fine print exactly. where your money is being invested. They exactly. may just say that we use diversified funding or diversified funds that we invest in. And look, and that's a good point with language, okay, because think about this. Let's talk about some of the top five companies that invest in private prison. McDonald's, Target, or Target, as some people <laughs> like to call it, Eddie Bauer. Okay, we have a list here of over 120 companies that we all go to every day and we don't think Where's our dollar menu money going? And are we prepared, once we have been informed, what are we prepared to do about it? Right. Are we prepared to say, I'm not going to these places, I'm not utilizing their services, we will find another way? Well, tell them about your own testimony, Doc, because, see, I remember we've been friends for many, many years, and you were a Rod or Doc Coca-Cola. I mean, Coca-Cola was everywhere. She, all around the world, she had Coca-Cola that had Japanese on it. Just, I mean, just she <laughs> was the Coca-Cola... And once she found out where all of that money from Coca-Cola was going in the situation with apartheid and everything, yeah. she just deaded it. And people couldn't understand, girl, you don't want to have a coconut no, smile? I don't. It's like, no. Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk about money, that's the one thing that we as African Americans refuse to talk about, the economics of how we can make a difference. But we have economic power. We are one right. of the largest consumers in this country. And if you look at black power, black wealth, black resources. It's not that we lack them, it's that we invest them poorly or in the wrong places. You know what we do? Mm -hmm. we, we, we're very lazy, mm -hmm. you know, and I know a lot of us don't like to hear that phrase, um, especially when it's coming from white folk, but the reality is, economically, we're very lazy, mm -hmm. especially when we go back to whoever that person was was talking about how they had to go get that TV. You know, it's easier to go spend that money than it is to take a moral stand against the person that's selling it to you. Right. You know what I mean? And so that's the way I look at that. And I, and, and I think that's what we have to figure out. One of the biggest things that I talk about on Ain't No Half Seven with Marcus J is that economic power is how we are going to make strides in this country. True. If you're sitting around trying to get someone who has already told you that he don't like you to, and you're trying to appeal to their morality, mm -hmm. you are the fool. Right. 
You know what I mean? And it has been proven in this country that the, re- the way that you make strides is to affect economics. You can start with slavery. And the reason why, you know, we don't have slavery anymore. We can talk about how great Lincoln was, but we all know that's a farce. Mm-hmm. You know, we can talk about, you know, what went on in the 60s and, and the bus boycotts and all that stuff. By definition, bus boycott exactly. economics. economics. That's right. You know what I mean? And so we have the blueprint. Right. And we don't follow it because we're it's, lazy. And also because it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient. Are exactly. Are you telling right. me that I have to walk? walk? Yeah. So, yes. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying to you. Yes. That there is some sweat equity that is required for this freedom. I yes. like that. The, I mean, really. It's I the like truth. that. Some it's sweat, sweat equity. equity. You've got to have some sweat and some skin in the game. You've got to do it. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're resting on the laurels of those who have preceded us. So when we see people who were tortured by dogs, and we see people who were tortured by water hoses that were held by officials who are supposed to be protecting and serving, right, that are turned against us, and we see these these pictures and these images, how many of us are really prepared to get out there Mm -hmm. and put our bodies on the line? Um, uh, Reverend Carruthers often says, talks about um, living on your feet rather than dying on your knees. You know, we've got to get out there and we've got to make a difference. And so we see people marching today and and see their bodies being put in the middle, you know, to protect other folks. Um, we've just got to go back to that. Like you said, Marcus, yeah, we've got the blueprint, but we have to not be lazy. We've got to say it's worth it and it matters. And it is inconvenient. It is inconvenient. But I'll tell you this. One of my dear brothers, um, Dr. Heber Brown in Maryland, I mean, he is just so phenomenal, feet on the ground. When they're talking about um, the cost of food in the Baltimore area and how just unfair and just ridiculous the prices are, their church just went ahead and got started and then did a community garden. And they just started growing and started partnering with black farmers so that now you don't have to go to the grocery store for all of that because you know that here even grocery stores, the cost of fresh fruit, fresh produce is higher than it is for canned stuff. Well, those people who have health challenges, diabetes and hypertension, canned foods have more sodium in it. They have things that you're not supposed to have in your body. And so it costs more to eat more healthy. Well, their church decided, okay, we're not going to continue to invest in systems that devalue us. We're going to have our own gardens, and you can eat fresh. It's not as always convenient. You've got to learn how to cook fresh food. It's not just pop the can and put it on the stove. stove, You've got to put some work into it, but it can be done. That said, I I just want to share some um, numbers. If you're someone that's out there that's on the ground, in the movement, doing it, please call in, 804-402-2893. You're listening to Enliven Live and Radio. Um, This is your girl, Silk, sitting in for Mr. LP, Stephen Sykes. I just want to give you guys some numbers um, when you talk about major differences. White men ages 18 or older incarcerated 1 in 106. Black men ages 18 or older 1 in 15. Black men ages 20 to 34 1 in 9. Those numbers like blow me away. And the reason being is as someone who has a African American son and I'm like going to get to the woman numbers but having a son who now, like I said, I threw out there, has a criminal record for having six seeds in his pocket, mm-hmm. okay? And those six seeds follow him around like Jack and the Beanstalk now, right. okay? For a pocket that even belonged to him, but that's neither here or there. The fact of the matter is that we would tax a criminal charge on somebody for the, what you perceive to be, well, you had six seeds, so that may have meant that you had this going along the line. The same thing when you were saying with the standardized testing, um, you take it at eight-year-old, and we can f- pretty much figure out who and what you're going to be. Um, you and I had this conversation that even when our children was in school, going up to the guidance office and not seeing anything about an HBCU or anything, the first thing you want to talk to my kid about is a trade, trade school, school. Um, mm-hmm. and not, you know, not college and things of that nature. Let's talk about black women ages 35 to 39, one in 100 in school. Um, excuse me, in jail. The thing that you talked about, Doc, and I wanted you to share is when we talk about, and we talked about this in our first season, the 
restoration of the village, right. disenfranchisement, okay, because right. we, we, we know the whole system, Marcus J., we know what happens when they go in jail, and we know all of that. But a lot of people don't pay attention to how the system is set up when it's they come afterlife. home from jail. Right. That, that the African-American family, just like you said, go back to slavery where they ripped apart and the man may be sold over here and the woman is sold over here. Because whenever that person gets out of jail, they can't return back to that family. Right. Because if that family is living in public housing, exactly. like They're you said, in public housing. they cannot return back to that family, which more than 50 percent has to go in public housing because that's the only way that they can make ends meet. If they have to fill out an application to apply for that apartment and they check that they got a criminal record, they go, well, okay, well, you qualify to live here, but they don't. So then what, what does it mean to pay your debt to society? Exactly. So if you are um, convicted of a crime and you are incarcerated and you have, quote, unquote, paid your debt to society, how long do you have to keep paying that debt? Forever. And is that fair? Obviously not. Because it's if that's the case, not. then the debt never it gets, gets paid. paid. It never, it never gets paid. What then happens to Say a that family? Again, I said it, the debt it never gets paid. Okay, so now think so, about back in slavery days when the debt to is say, never you know, paid. You work here and you can buy your freedom. Right. Okay, and you work in and then you go. Okay, master, I got this much saved up. It's all. You know what? Did the I say that? Inflation, the price is just going when, up. You remember when they said that going to jail was rehabilitation? Right. That they would rehabilitate right. you from whatever your, you know, and I always say the word wrong, but the recidiv recidivism mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. is, I always say it wrong, <laughs> uh, it's, it's high mm -hmm. because the reality is if you go into jail mm -hmm. as an 18-year-old with a minor whatever, and you go in there and you basically learn how to be a better criminal once you're in there. And so when you come out and the only skills that you got when you were 18 through 30, that's probably the reason why those numbers are so high, uh, because that's the prime age of learning how to be a grown up. I mean, we can teach you education stuff as a 10 year old, but you learn how to be a grown up when you're right. 20. Right. But you learned how to be a criminal because you was in jail. And so when you come out, you don't have the grown-up skills that you need. you got criminal skills. And you might have a little bit of sense, and you try not to be a criminal, but at the end of the day, if you can't go get a job like the system tells you that you need to because you got that record, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to hire you because you have a record, what are you supposed to do? Now, I'm not sitting here justifying it. I'm certainly not doing that. But if you are, are dealing with a person that has a level of desperation, and that's what it's created. To and be. that's what it's going to be. Right. I mean, you're going to do, you know, desperate people do desperate things. When you're talking about people who have to put food on the table. Right. Right. Yeah. And if you have to get your hustle together to get food on the table, yep. then that's that's um, that leads people to make some decisions, some tough decisions that have to get made every day. Yep. And there was a time I know that there were literacy programs that were um, available to persons who were incarcerated. And regardless of how much time you had, you had um Libraries. You had teachers going in. You had all different types of industries going in, supposedly to help people to get skills that they could use when they come out. But then the trap becomes when you come out, and I know that you have a record, then I will hire you at a far lower rate than you can eat, eat off, off of, right. right, or give you menial positions or menial jobs. So that means that you're going to have to come up with a way that you can become an entrepreneur where you can make your own money, make your own, create your own business, and then you need a support system. Some people that are out here on the outside waiting on you to come home, waiting on you and believing that you are worth um, fighting for, that you are worth the, the um, investment. Right. right? Well, let's even talk about before you come out. Because the system is so set up, okay, most of these places are over well, let's talk about first why you shouldn't even You've be been in there. Because there's some right. people who are habitual, um, some people that are habitual, but there are some people who are caught up, caught up and right. it's not them. Right. How many times do we hear later on after somebody's been on death row and right. Right, right up to the 11th hour and they're saying that I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, all the information is in, you see that they're not guilty and they still go to the electric chair. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that young man that stayed all of that time in jail and never went before a judge. And I'm like, how does that happen? I right. know how it happens because I have a family member right now who is in that situation, okay. you know, without getting too deep into his personal situation. Mm -hmm. You know, he was 20, he's 22. <laughs> wow. 
dumb. He, he's mm-hmm. a dummy. Yeah, let's just be honest. You know, he made a lot of really stupid decisions. However, the thing that got him in there, you know, he's been sitting waiting for a trial for a year. Literally. He'd been in since July of 14. And it was his mother who was doing her own research who found a law that said something about a speedy trial. I'm not versed mm-hmm. in the law and all that mm-hmm. stuff, so I'm not going to mm-hmm. profess to be. But his attorney never did all of that. It was his mother who went to the attorney and said, do you know about this? And the attorney responded as if they were unaware of it. Mm-hmm. And when the attorney researched it, my, you know, my, my family member got a phone call a few days after that saying, guess what? The trial is set for boom. Mm-hmm. Right. And his, that was his so you mother. You need advocates. You, you need, need, it. There you, need you go. strong mm-hmm. advocates, mm-hmm. people that are going to be like watchmen and watchwomen on the wall. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. And, yep. and I think you raised a valid point, but then we need people afterwards when they come, you know, when, when they get out. Mm-hmm. Okay, because, you know, you always see a vision. It's not like TV, no, okay, not. where they get out and they give them a nice new suit and a couple of dollars for their pocket, and you might get driven to the bus station. I mean, I know in New York at Rikers, they take you to the edge of the bridge, and then it's just like, okay, I guess you're going to be walking across that bridge. Right. You ain't had change in your pocket when you came in, and then what? Right. And, 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 and then what? Yeah, they dump you out. You right. know? And then these places are overcrowded. A lot of them are overtaxed. And then also, what, something that we're not even, we don't often take a look at, is that when our loved ones are incarcerated for whatever length of time, they're subject to a lot of violent behavior inside. Which now brings them into either catching more cases, more charges, more time, or they develop a whole different persona that survival, survival strategies. strategies. And so that's what ends up happening. You have survival strategies, and what does that look like? And then um, how do you live You know, while you're there? How do you live? How do you function? Agreed. Agreed. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Thank you for calling in. Hey, I just wanted to call. My name is Reverend Carruthers. I wanted to call and really encourage you in the work that you're doing. I think that uh, given the social climate, uh, not only now, but what it has always been, uh, that there uh, is a need uh, to disseminate information by way of dialogue and statistics, you know, that support our concern of people who are a, dealing with being massively incarcerated but also dealing with the paradigm of leaving there and asking the question, where do I go from here? And so as you speak to creating spaces and opportunities for them, I think that that is just uh, an awesome thing that the ecumenical movement and Ecclesia as a whole ought to be really concerned about um, because if we are not concerned about that, then we basically leave uh, uh, people out here uh, without the resources necessary to sustain themselves. And sustainability, as we know, uh, is a sacred place even in in and unto itself. And so if we don't uh, provide them with the tools that they need to build the houses, then they won't live in them, and therefore they will have to go back to uh, where they just came from, which would be recidivism underscored. And so, again, I was just listening to you and just uh, in prayer about your ministry and the mission uh, ahead of you. And I just believe that you all are doing a great and wonderful thing. So be encouraged and uh, continue doing what you're doing. Thank you, um, Pastor Crothers. But I'm going to put you on the spot because um, for everyone that's out there, I did announce in the beginning that, you know, I was hoping that you were going to be able to listen and to call in. You know, you're my brother. You're out there in Chicago and um, Pastor the Urban Serengeti, and you're out there. And I wanted to talk to someone who is out, actually out there in the urban jungle talking to the brothers and sisters when um, they come home, um, paying attention to how this monopoly of private prisons where the, the, the um, board of directors, one of the things that I threw out earlier, um, Pastor, was that um, a lot of people didn't know that CCA, who owns the majority of the private prisons, Thurgood Marshall Jr. sits on their board of directors. How ironic is that? Right, right. I um, I have this philosophy, if you would, or this term that I have began to use over the years that implies that there are systems that reduce people from characters to commodities. Characters to commodities, which is to imply I'm no longer concerned about your welfare or well-being. I'm concerned about 
uh, the value that you represent to me in this uh, uh, pool called mass incarceration in the correctional facility. Why would I pay you 10 or $15 an hour when I can pay you $2 a week or $2 a month? And so it becomes a financial necessity to have these people uh, uh, inside of these prisons because of the economic incentives that linger. And there would be the beginning of the war on drugs and the myth that that was. But in a real sense, when I'm out here talking to these brothers and sisters in the concrete jungle, what amazes me is how they feel uh, as though they are operating without credentials, identification. Um, they're operating without just of things that they can present to other institutions to say that I am somebody, I am legitimate, et cetera, and so on. And so now they're becoming more and more invisible. And then there's a psychological warfare to consider. For example, if a man is coming out of prison to reunite with his family and the mother lives in Section 8, he cannot be home with his wife or his children. He may be able to stand across the street, but in order to enter that house, you would be breaking the law. And so that's a way of disenfranchising a community as well. And so there are so many systems in place that these young people and older people are dealing with that are derivatives uh, of mass incarceration, derivatives of systemic genocide, and derivatives of the warehousing of black folk for economic gain. That is overwhelming, and it just reminds me of Frederick Douglass, how he said it is better to build strong children than to repair broken men. These men are broken now, and in that brokenness, there's been a shift of responsibility and weight, and that pendulum has swung more so to our sisters, who are now in many instances ahead of the household, and this is not by accident. And so when I talk to these people out here, they're dealing with uh, how to navigate and negotiate themselves through that type of trauma without um and please without say, i guess please say that um, again because ahead, that's a sorry. that's a key word that dr burton and i talked about time and time again and the word is trauma it is trauma it is traumatic what is going on it's almost like we're a generation walking down with post-traumatic stress disorder exactly. and don't even realize it and then when then when people explode then they want to act like this is something brand new. Talk about that trauma. One of the things that I've been learning lately is that as we uh, participate nationwide in this clarion call for reparations, is that that is normally attached to revenue. We seem to place a monetary assessment or value on our trauma. Uh, what I'm beginning to learn is that reparations, in fact, has more so to do with creating spaces for healing basis for wholeness to be acquired, and America has never allowed us, if you would, to have that sacred space that we might collectively and internally heal so that we can then uh, reimagine ourselves as something other than what we have been down through the years, so to speak, and W.B. Du Bois alludes to that uh, in uh, a philosophical term that he describes as double consciousness, which means that I am not showing you who I actually am. I am behaving in a manner in which I feel as though you expect me to. Mm -hmm. And so in that, you never get to know who I really am anyway. And so there's a disconnect. Even at that, we are not able to really allow ourselves to be ourselves and present ourselves authentically to America without the fear of the shock and awe that later follows the truth that we uh, provide. You know, Malcolm X Martin Luther King assassinated for what the truth and so at this point in the game you have to be willing to die on your feet as opposed to live on your knees and unfortunately once we get something as a people a little bit of something we then say well that's not my problem that's theirs and we worry about self-preservation and maintaining the little bit that we now have that we were otherwise that from. Agreed, agreed. And, and, and stand by um, um, Pastor Crothers we definitely want to dialogue with you um, for a minute. I'm going to go to um, Dr. Carmichael and get some input on that. Yeah, I absolutely agree with um, Pastor Carruthers, and um, there are occasions where we talk about this, and we talk about what black grief looks like and black suffering, and how even in the midst of all that we are enduring now, that as a people we are not being afforded the opportunity to grieve. 
For example, when we lost nine people at one time out of one church, church. and then the immediate response was forgiveness, we have not yet grieved the loss of nine individual people. And if you look at your own families and if you have lost anyone that you love in your own family, how long does it take? And um, I spoke with one of my dear friends who is from the continent of Africa, and I asked her, so what is the grieving process? And she said for every one person that dies, we have at least 90 days, 90 days of grieving plus 10. So we're talking about 100 days So we have not yet begun the grieving process. We have not hollered yet. We have not screamed yet. We have not said, you know, not just unfair, unjust, but we have not gotten through the stages of grief. And we're being asked to continue to swallow more and more and more of that. And then, as uh, Pastor Carruthers says, we're masking all of that, walking around as if nothing is wrong, when in fact everything Everything is is wrong. wrong. Everything is wrong. Marcus? I think uh, when when the brothers spoke of the the dual the duality uh, that that touched me that spoke to me because it's a lot of what many of us uh, we do mm-hmm. and you know whenever we speak out about how we actually feel you know we have to deal with so much we have to deal with uh, the majority race in the country and how they will react. We have to deal with how we feel about their reaction. We have to deal with, you know, the natural inclination to forgive them. You know, with all due respect, I'm not doing that. At least not two days after you just killed my grandma, I'm not going to be doing that. You know, and we have to deal with, you know, the Sambos in our own communities. Please don't say Uncle Tom. That's not the one. (laughs) The the Sambos, you know, in our own community who are going to look at you a certain kind of way. And I'll be honest with you. I mean, I respect you know, those folks who, who come from that angle, but I'm a little bit more Malcolm and Huey than I am Martin and Megger, mm-hmm. with all due respect to them. And so that's how I that's how I look at that. And then you have to deal with, you know, in our country everybody tells you, never forget. You know you're never supposed to get nine eleven and you're never supposed to forget the Holocaust. And you're never supposed to forget the Great Depression. I hear you. And you're never supposed to forget (laughs) any of those things. However. However, (laughs) slavery, y'all need to get over it. Get over over that. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, the older I get, the more angry I become. And I have no fear with saying that I am an angry black man. I get so tired of black men shielding and hiding their anger. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be mad. That's right. And I'm very angry. Right. And that's, you know. And I think that there's something about being angry and then channeling it in the proper direction. Absolutely. What we don't need are loose cannons Absolutely. running around and, you know, creating or saying Making that they're starting. Exactly. <laughs> right? But it has to be channeled. It has to be focused because it's righteous anger. It's righteous indignation. And it has a place. And I think that um, we're, we, we all feel it. And everything that you just said is absolutely true, trying to figure out um, – Am I being quote unquote militant? Are people looking at me a certain way? But then I guess when you get mad enough, when you get angry enough, you get tired enough, it's just um, enough already. Right. And so you know where that mm-hmm. fear comes though? Mm-hmm. When you look at, you know, people who are putting themselves in a position to be helpful and, you know, one of several things happen. You know, they either sully that person's name so that anything that they say right. is rendered useless. Right. And if that person rises above that, you know, then they may figure out some sort of way to incarcerate them so that mm-hmm. anything that they do will be rendered useless. Exactly. And if they rise above that, then they put a bullet in them. Exactly. And, I mean, you raised a very, very good point, and that's where um, I was just getting ready um, to, to make that statement is just that why are we so afraid to talk about the reality of what it is. Racism does exist. (coughs) Police brutality does exist. The officer is acting like the overseer. Same number of letters in the same word, okay? Why are we so afraid? You know, the funny thing is, and I share with you, that um, I wasn't impressed when South Carolina took the flag down. Okay, because if I was like, if that's the case, then take the American flag down. And I got bombarded with, like, all of these things. And I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute. We're talking about the red, white, and blue. But, you know, tell the truth, shame the devil. 
I never stood up and pledged allegiance to the flag when I was a kid mm -hmm. because I couldn't understand how a flag allowed my grandmother to be spat upon, that my grandmother couldn't drink out of a flower, that my grandfather, who was a Buffalo soldier who fought in three wars for this country but still had to go in the back door to get something to drink or to eat, how my grandmother and my grandfather traveled south, but because my grandfather was light-skinned with gray eyes and could pass for white, he was welcome, but my grandmother couldn't go in certain hotels. So I'm really, really confused. I'm confused about we celebrate a holiday of a man who was lost and brought his ass here by getting detoured and stuck a, a flag and said, hey, I claim this to the name of, or whatever, but we don't celebrate. We got to fight to get a Martin Luther King holiday. We got to fight for people who actually stood for something, but every thief and <laughs> every thief to that, has a know, holiday. Can Pastor I share something? Brother? Yeah, go ahead, brother. I got excited. Uh, to that point, as soon as you said Martin Luther King, it felt like lightning just came through the walls or something, but to that point, because I'm going to try to draw a parallel between uh, uh, trauma and the trajectories thereof and what happens in the aftermath, but to that point, yes, we have secured Martin Luther King Day, correct? Mm -hmm. However, look at Martin Luther King Boulevard. Right. right. Nationwide, that's what trauma does. Right. It causes, it causes you to seize yourself, the W.B. Du Bois, to seize yourself and act as if you are this internalized image that you are not. And I think that one of the things that we need to focus on when it comes to reentry is uh, a different vocabulary because there's so much power in language, so much power in words, you know, this convict thing. You're still a man. Bill Lucy said that in the 60s with a post that I'm still a man. Whatever is attached to me, I'm still a man. I'm still a human being and we live in a point right now where uh, confession especially of black men has been criminalized and, and it has been a uh, spectacleized and it has been turned into humor and satire as if we are this metaphor of an angry black man no these concerns are legitimate you don't have to live them but they are legitimate to us and so for every laugh that you make that's those are scars that we have to deal with you know, and then being sociologically castrated in front of our children because a mother always has to sign for this or that. The mother says, this is my house, etc., and so on. And that's not to have anything against my sisters. However, it is to say that systemic genocide and systematic genocide includes that as one of its links in the chain. And so we have to realize that, which is to mean that we have to stop this gender war between us, brother and sister, you know. And I hear so many sisters say, I, I don't need a man. But then if you listen, you need many because this one is an electrician, this one is a counselor, this one is a best friend, etc. We all need each other. And we have to stop uh, exercising the art of segregation, if you would, amongst ourselves and become a little more communal and being responsible for our children. The sagging should not be going down. I'm not against hip-hop, but it promotes a negative culture. It promotes a prison culture and you internalize that identity. Perhaps we should have protests. Why should our children buy Skittles and, and uh, candy through bulletproof glass and bars? And then we have to teach our children that even in response, even under the, uh, uh, the old L. Rookins and stuff, even with the Muslims, they are civil, they are obedient. And that way, if you cross the line, they become justified in a reaction. We cannot uh, proceed as if we are using this to have displaced aggression as well. We have to proceed with a certain discipline that allows us to maintain our dignity so that the mass media cannot say, look at them, that's why we don't give them nothing, they just don't tear right. it up anyway. Right, exactly. And you raised a valid point because, I mean, the sad thing about it is, is that when you go on a Martin Luther King Boulevard pretty much in every state, it's deemed in the heart of the hood, so to speak. When you go on a Malcolm X Boulevard, pretty much in every state, it's usually a project that sits right in the middle there. And what a lot of people don't seem to realize is that right down to even the projects and subsidized housing, those projects was exactly what it's called. It was a project. That's how it got its name. It was a test. It was a test to take a group of people and put them in a situation like a mouse in a cage and watch how they would adapt to the area. 
okay? And a lot of people, I've seen people fight to stay in the projects, okay? Um, as somebody who used to work for the housing authority, I remember when they were going to tear down the local housing authority here, and I was like, wow, this is great. And then I went to the meeting, and the people was like ballistic, like, what you mean you tearing down the projects? My mama and them lived here. My cousin and them lived there. And so it becomes, you know, I had a, a new an associate that actually turned down Section 8. And instead of people encouraging her and telling her, wow, that's great, they were like, girl, you stupid. You didn't take advantage of those benefits or whatever. But she managed getting, on, getting her home on her own and being able to be free from the shackles that come attached to living in subsidized housing. The most degrading thing for me as an African-American woman is watching young girls on utility check day want to fight you for a $5 utility check because R. Kelly is coming into town and this is their extra money. So I think that we, we've done, we've got to take back educating our children ourselves. I remember one of the things that Doc and I talked talked about is that when I was a kid, it was mandatory that we read, but we also read books for us, about us, that showed us the other side. Marcus J. and I talked offline the other um, week when I was here on Mr. LP show when we were talking about the distractions of Bill Cosby and things of that nature, and, and Marcus raised the valid point of being able to separate Cliff Huxtable and Bill Cosby as two different people. What Bill Cosby done, if he's done it, then he needs to be tried, convicted, or whatever. But Cliff Huxtable provided a positive black male image to young black men, and the Cosby show gave us something to see that we can live, we can live well, our children could be well spoken, it enlightened us to what HBCUs are and the camaraderie and all of the wonderful things about going to a historical black college, it restored a, 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 a sense of self. Yeah. A sense of self can I ask you a question? And accomplishments. Um, and again, I agree right. with you totally that right. they're not the same person, that he plays a wonderful guy on TV. Right. 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 But in his own personal life, he has some challenges that I think need to be addressed. Right. And there's no pass for that. No. Right. right. You, but you, Elvis Presley was a pedophile, but yeah. yet you can go in his house. You know, I'm angry about that. When you talk about angry, I'm angry that Michael Jackson's house is on an auction block. No one will consider, none of our so say African Americans with money won't consider buying it and making it a museum for all of the good that he did across the world or whatever. But you can go to Tennessee and go to Graceland and see where Priscilla and Elvis walk the garden and whatever. What has Elvis ever freaking done for the betterment of humankind? And Can again, I ask you a question? once you want to destroy a person's distraction, Michael Jackson, the humanitarian, and Michael Jackson accused of being a pedophile and all of these other things, two different things. Can I ask you a question? Go for it. Go for it. I, w I wonder what it would look like to, as a part of reentry, uh, redefine incarceration. I wonder what that dialogue would look like because many of us on the outside of those prison walls are in a greater sense of bondage than those who are on the inside, as we uh, discussed Malcolm X by the, uh, earlier, my brother said it, I thought about that time in the movie when he said you have to be free in your mind, and there you find your liberty and your spirituality, so to speak. So I'm wondering what that dialogue would be like so that when people are re-entering, they realize that they're still in the same population of, let's say, um, prisons, if you would. And so we're all emancipated in terms of our consciousness, you know, because we all live in different prisons. And so what does freedom at that point actually look like and how is it relative? And if we're talking about reentry, I think one of the primary cell blocks that needs to be escaped is that of your mind. And so what are we having there to stimulate the mind and reaffirm someone's humanity so that they realize they're not just an ex-con looking for a job, but that you are a human being searching for the same substance that he needs other peer would seek. You know what I mean? No, I, 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 I absolutely agree with you. I think one of the things that we uh, are dealing with is that the reality is we live in a whitewashed world. And the world that we live in is not necessarily conducive to what our needs are. When you are going to school and you're reading, you know, books and literature, 
that they told you that you had to read 50 years ago. Our parents was reading Tom Sawyer. We got to read Tom Sawyer, and I know that Tom Sawyer is probably not what they read now, but the point I'm making is the dude that was in Tom Sawyer, the black dude, or was it Huck yeah. Finn? Whichever one it was, Huck mm-hmm. Finn, that was Jim. Jim was a slave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what exactly. I mean? Right. You know, and so that is the image that we have. You know, I didn't read up from slavery till I got to college. You know what I mean? It would have been real nice to read Invisible Man when I was 13. Right. You know what I mean? So this is one of the things that we have to deal with, and we're constantly told that it's the American way, and we, 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 we feed into that. Truth of the matter is, and I've taken some heat for this because I've said this on Ain't No Half Step and Marcus J, but one of the worst things that ever happened to us was that we were integrated. That was like one of the worst things worst that ever thing. happened. Yeah. You know, and I'm not saying that because I got a problem with white folk. I got a problem with anybody that got a problem with me and mine. Right. Right. But the truth of the matter is before we were so gung-ho about integrating, we had our own businesses, we had our own neighborhoods, we had our own right. togetherness, and, you know, daddy lived at the crib and all of that kind of stuff. You do, do you realize yeah, at 41 years old, I'm 41 years old, in my neighborhood when I grew up, I was the only kid on the block who had his father, and those kids gave me a hard time because of it? Right. Exactly. <laughs> they picked amazing? on me because I had my father. How exactly. crazy is that? Mm-hmm. That's right. absolutely outrageous. And I think the mindset that it's okay to do poorly is, is where we need to start. That's where we need to start. You know, it's, 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 it's cool to sag your pants or it's cool to be the dummy in the classroom. All of those things are cool. Yeah, I think part of that comes back to reclaiming the village and the, the whole village mentality. You need to have the elders. You need to have the educators. You need to have those who support right. financially. And you need to have those who support educationally and culturally. So what we need to really start looking at is what does it mean to take our children and to provide educational spaces for them. If we're saying that the school systems don't provide them what they need, then we're obligated to do it. And we can't continue to allow a school system that is broken to pretend to educate our children. If we're saying that our standardized testing is not for our children, we need to divest of that system. And I'm just so serious about that. So when you have schools that are starting home schools for black children, you have um, neighborhood schools that are starting that teach um, African languages. Um, we need to invest in them. We need to send our children, our nieces, our nephews, everybody that we know, and we need to support those schools just like we would with any other um, public a, or private school. And you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said about that because I went to one of those schools as a child. Mm-hmm. And so by the time he was telling me Columbus discovered America, I was asking the question, who is he waving at? Uh, and <laughs> to my brother's point, I'm serious. Okay, and to my brother's right? point, I think one of the things that we need to do in terms of just um, the esteem building is I think, and this is not an either or, this is a both and or in addition to. Um, but I think that um, our role models and the images, I think that at some point we need to uh, look at the entertainment field right now and say that's not funny. Little Wayne talking about making sexual overtures to Miley Cyrus, who was a minor. That's not funny. Right. Uh, R. Kelly. R. Kelly was in the middle of court, and we were about to nominate him. The NAAC, NAACP, or whoever was about to nominate him uh, to, for the Image Award. I mean, we're sending very contradictory messages about how we even feel about our woman because we call them the B word, and that's the new norm and narrative. I'm his number one. B, really, where did that come from? And, and where did this culture of violence uh, come from uh, domestically that is considered cool? And so all of that has to be undone. And I think that, unfortunately, what we allow with our challenge, uh, and though we might like the individuals, T.I., Tupac, whoever, we have to look at what is being lyrically disseminated unto our people and, and how that has sown seed into their spirit and how they are responding based on those notions and, and small concepts that are fertilized somewhere in your soul that will ultimately manipulate your mindset and cause you to do or be or think or perceive things a certain way. That's just what music does. And so when I look at that, we need to begin to also hold our people who do have privilege more accountable right. to what they do with that privilege because they are not necessarily... Uh, um, us because they look like us. I mean, they are also instruments to the psychological warfare that we're struggling with anyway. They're just tools for the for the other side, if, if you understand what I'm saying. And they don't know it. They're just looking at money, not the moral barometer associated with it. 
Let me let me make a connection um, because you touched on a couple of really really good things. When we talk about the music, you know, I, I always like to joke about someone my age at 41. I'm probably the youngest of the original hip hop generation um, because I was 10 years old when uh, Run DMC first hit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And okay. so I yeah, remember. Yeah when you know hip-hop was about boastful i'm the man that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and i very very clearly remember almost to, matter of fact not even almost i remember to the year 1987 <laughs> when it changed it and and the reason why it changed is because the people who were creating the music realized that they could say whatever they wanted to say mm -hmm. and anytime you have creative uh creative control you're going to say what you're feeling. You're going to say what you're going through. And just follow me here for a second. Mm -hmm. That's when you started seeing the misogyny. That's when you started seeing the violence. But you know what that's all, you also started seeing? You started seeing the grit and the, and the hardcore and the bad word to the mm -hmm. police and all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff because it was the experience of mm -hmm. the artist. But what happened next was that the people who owned the record labels realized that the people who were spitting them rhymes had the control of the minds of the youth. Yeah. That is when you had people like Chuck D and people right. like the Native Tongues and people like yeah, yeah, BDP and all of them started being phased out. Mm -hmm. And that is when you started seeing things like NWA and Ice-T right. and Ice Cube being put yes, to sir. the forefront. Now, I, I, I do take a little bit of an exception when people want to put it solely on music, especially when we watch movies, then nobody want to take up a Uzi and shoot up people because mm -hmm. Rambo did it. Right. You know what I mean? And so th there, we do need to kind of not jump too much on it. But when we're looking at 2015, mm -hmm. I think we need to take these kids back because we, we were the ones who started this. Right. And if I can right. interject on that, because that's a good point. One of the things Doc and I talked about on the show is what are we allowing to be poured into our children and into ourselves? I remember to the day the very first reality show was Flavor of Love with Flavor Flav. That was the only reality show on TV. But then you also and had, um, what is that show on MTV? Real yeah. World. Real, Real world. world. Real World, right? Yeah. Then, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, now every single person, mm -hmm. every single thing has a, it. now reality is even scripted, exactly. okay? All of the reality shows are scripted. And they show a false sense. I mean, you talk about the housewives. They perpetuate this whole angry black woman syndrome that we can't be friends. We have no sisterhood. We sleep with each other's husbands. We cheat. We do. And they fall into this foolishness. You know something? I was, last night, my son was laying across the foot of my bed, and we was talking. We wasn't even watching TV, but Love and Hip Hop came on. And he started laughing, and I said, why are you laughing? He said, what is it about these women and all these reality shows? All they do is throw drinks on each other. And I started thinking about that, and I was like, every single show, and it goes back to that white man myth of the girl fights, you know, with them, the wet t-shirt parties and all of that stuff. And I was like, you know what? I didn't even think about that. It's foolishness. But what are we allowing to pour into when we look at now? I mean, think about this. Walt Disney has sexual overtones in its cartoons. Mm -hmm. Okay, and everybody, you tell people that and they go, oh, no, not Disney. And then you show them and they go, wow, I never paid. This whole subliminal messaging that we're receiving, like you said, uh, Pastor Carruthers, programming uh, subliminally, we don't control our TV. Even BET sold us out. Okay, BET was, we went, I remember when BET hit their airwaves, BET was about us, it showed us in a positive light, it made us feel good that we had a station that belonged to us. And then all of a sudden it became once again, like Marcus said, economics and money and who had the bigger dollar and it's gone by the wayside. Yeah, yeah, I mean I remember BET when it was, you know, big and, you know, because I remember Teen Summit, I used to mm -hmm. watch it, you and know, I, and I remember, you know, it was a college tour in 1993 that caused me to choose journalism as my degree, and that tour was to BET. Uh, but what ended up happening, like everything else that we've talked about here tonight, is capitalism. Mm -hmm. Bob Johnson sold out. It's that right. simple. It is, it is that simple, and you can see the shift in the programming from when the Johnsons had it until when I think it's Viacom or whoever has it now. 
So then we come back to when do we divest of this foolishness? When do we say that doesn't play here in our house? We don't watch that here. My children don't watch this. When do we say that's not coming in here? It's not infecting our children. This is not acceptable to us. I got one better for you. When we do say it, because there are some of us that do say it, mm -hmm. then what do we do? And I'm going to put this out to you, um, um, Pastor Crothers, because you're out there. Then how do we protect our children? Because like you said, you got bullied for having my father having your father mm -hmm. i got bullied bullied because i was educated i got bullied because i like to read i got bullied we get accused of you think you know everything because you speak well are you acting I, white? exactly acting white i remember one of the biggest things if you wanted to piss my mother sandra hardy love you if you wanted to piss my mother off tell her oh your children are so well behaved I don't see why people think that's a compliment. Yeah. What okay. Did you that well, what did too. you expect them to be? Okay. What did you say? Oh, they're so well mannered. What did you expect them to be? So, with that being said, Pastor Crothers, on the flip side, yes, Dr. Burton is right to do all of these things. But then, how do we protect our children who have to go out into the jungle and survive with those pluses, I guess, so to speak, in their corner? Uh, I think uh, one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think one of the things that would be paramount is that we have to remind them of their own eminence and who they are. Uh, briefly, there was an example, I think it was called the Ying Yang Twins, and they had this song called Drop Down and mm -hmm. Get to, you know the song. Mm -hmm. And I saw these young ladies doing it, and I said, do you know what they're talking about? And they said, no. And I said, well, let me explain it to you. And I explained it to them semi-graphically so that they would understand what that meant, and they didn't do that dance anymore. I think when we understand that there is a language beyond the beat and we begin to hear that, that makes a difference between what the OJs were talking about versus what uh, a bird man is talking about. You know, we can still dance to either, but they're conveying two different messages like Hitler and King. You know, I think one thing we do need to uh, uh, let people know is that uh, certain things should not be said to you. You're not my N-word. You're my brother. You're our king. You know, you're not my B. You're my exactly. sister. You're a queen. Exactly. And I think when we begin to positively affirm our humanity in that way, then when we go places, we won't allow people to speak to us that way because there's a behavior also associated with that. For example, if you are a gentleman, it is because you behaved this way. If you're considered a lady, it's because you behaved that way. If you're I'm considered glad, a thug, it is because you, you behaved that. that way, which is to imply that language has something to do with the architecting of your behavior. So we need to change the language, and language is so serious and and uh, the hegemony, you know, the, uh, the people who are manipulating this whole thing that we're dealing with called government and otherwise, they understand that very well. And so they try to blur some lines and have certain things lost in translation that were adhesives in our community. What do I mean? The term, my dear, for example, if I said my dear, that meant my auntie, that meant TT, that meant my big mm -hmm. sister or a sister in the community that was an elder that I respected that I could go to and, as my brother said earlier, in a moment of lament and cry out like a rock and say, here is my problem, and I'm not ashamed to say it because I'm talking to my dear, someone who is not going to hurt me, et cetera, and so on. But now when we say my dear, we're thinking about a 6'3 man in drag, <laughs> and so there's something lost in translation right there, and so we don't have that as a munition anymore, vocabulary. Do you see what I'm saying? And so we have to look oh, at the languages <laughs> that were lost. For example, you just like your daddy, or you're a bad child, or you're an ugly child, or you're a stupid child. That was not the language of the 60s. Right. It was just smart. You're going to make it. You can do it. I'll be there with you. Go ahead. Give it a try. I got your back. We were training wheels one to another. That has ceased to be the case. I like that, and you're right. Because the language has changed. I'm, I'm glad that you said that because, like, even the, um, the young man who I'm sitting in for, <clears throat> Mr. LP, great guy, very, very intelligent, very, very well-spoken, and a gentleman, and he gets raked over the coals a lot just because of who he is being a gentleman, you know? It's like I've actually talked to some woman who actually thought he had perverted natures because he pulled out the chair for them or something, you know, I remember even my husband um, coming to a property one time, I was working in a low income development, 
and he held the door and I heard all of this commotion and this young lady was in his face cursing him out because he held the door for her and she was like I don't need no man to do this for me and I think one of the other things that you said is is that and this is an argument that I have with our young brothers all the time that idiotic comment that they done took the word nigga and done changed it to nigga and changed the spelling and they think that it's okay that we go out on you know one of the things that I tell you know I got on Facebook to network to get my book information and things out there and to keep in touch but the one thing that I've even learned with social media is you can't be in a social media forum dealing with people who have no social skills you have people have you out ever, there that utilize have you ever this seen the boondocks? craziness has anyone ever seen the boondocks Definitely. yes with Riley and Mr. Freeman and there's a character on there that, that really epitomizes our plight and illustrates where we are dispositionally right now. And that's a character called Uncle Ruckus. Uncle Ruckus hates himself, and therefore when he looks at other black men who are successful, Mr. Freeman or the lawyer next door, he has nothing but venom to spew on them because he, in his own reflection, does not see anything uh, beyond pain, hurt, and brokenness. So it makes them the consummate skeptic when it comes to just encouraging folks. Do you see what I'm saying? A lot of these young black men see failure. They see their fathers in newspapers in the in the five and dime store called mug shot and nap shot. They see their uncles and their big cousins. They see all of their role models, you know, just do you see what I'm trying to say? Oh yeah. We need more positive images. You. And that is a character that uh, has left an indelible imprint in my mind. But I'm out here in the concrete jungles, you know, just dealing with people because I see how there's so much internalized pain there that they don't have it in them. It's in them somewhere, but it's difficult to love. It's, it's, it's terrifying to love or to be transparent because look what happened before in your state of vulnerability, i.e. your pre and or your, your, um, your childhood years when you were just treated as something less than human anyway, so you lose faith in humanity, and perhaps that's why it's so easy to kill. Perhaps that's why this violence is so easy to participate in, because you're not seeing the soul of a person or the spirit of a person. You're just seeing someone in your cipher that is in your way or opposing uh, what you would like to employ as your will. You know what I mean? You don't see the family connection. You're just mad at the moment. You don't see that you're going to kill someone's father, someone's son, someone's brother, that they all depend on. You don't see that in the current scenario. So we need to uh, provide them a different lens by which to view life in, and that is one also of expectancy. You can have, you will have, but you have to do it. You know, it's sad because you can't expect someone to value you if they don't value themselves. So, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't, I don't care about me, so why should I care about you, you know? Right. And that's the mentality when you speak, You're right. when you speak, brother, You're about right. the language, man. I, I tell you, that, that, that word just curdles my blood every time I hear it. And, 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 and you spoke, sister, of how the idiotic argument of trying to take back the meaning of it. It's like, come on, man. You know, if you really want to go there, then we can talk about negus, N-E-G-U-S. Right. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? But that ain't what they're saying. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's not what they're saying. Right. And I would argue that most of them don't even know what N-E-G-U-S yes, is. is. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And so this is just crazy to me. And you don't see any other culture do it. And I think that we have fallen so deeply into the celebration of negativity that, you know, I, I get frustrated because I wonder how we're going to pull ourselves, you know, pull ourselves out of it. Right. You know, like what, what, right. what are we going to do? And, it, and I think a lot of it, you know, is psychological and a lot of these bad habits we picked up in, you know, in slavery and things of that sort. And so, you know, I, I think that people like us starting the dialogue, starting the, uh, the path towards positivity, you know, and brother, you on the ground where you are, you know, as the sisters have spoke of. So, you know, you are definitely absolutely part of the solution. You know, and I think if people are listening to us tonight and we go back to our respective, you know, communities right. and, and continue this kind of dialogue, I, you know, I have to think that that's our start, but it's got to be so much more. There is, and there's always. Oh, no doubt. They say the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You just have to keep walking until right. you get there. That's right, and we have to make the conscious decision to do it. 
Right. I, I agree. And I think um, going what Marcus just said is that explains why, like, even with the young lady, Sandra Bland, when we have African Americans trying to justify why this young lady, they believe she's responsible for her own death, like, well, why didn't she just shut up? And why didn't she just, you know, put out her cigarette? And why, and, and, and without expanding, we and I talk about, okay, I'm in my car. I'm not doing anything. I know my rights. And when you come at me, you're already coming aggressive and you're using words like I'm going to light you up and things of that nature. That's escape, you know, totally. Yeah, the sad part for me is when I hear our brothers saying things like that, like she should have just kept quiet or um, because we really need some brothers who are willing to stand with us, right? Her life is not expendable. And I, and this is just my confession, um, and uh, Tracy, you know this, whenever I have had the occasion to be um, pulled over by some blue lights, I always call her on the phone and I keep the phone line open because the first question that I'm always asked after the police tap my car to leave their fingerprints on my car as evidence that they've been there um, in case something happens to them during this procedure, um, the first thing that they always ask is they say, good evening, ma'am, good morning, ma'am, or then they'll say, do you know why I stopped you? I have no idea why you stopped me. And so my response is always, no, I have no idea why you stopped me. Now, the way that I say that might be a trigger for somebody else. I'm not loud or abrasive, but I'm very direct. No, I don't have any idea why you did this. And so I'm waiting for an explanation. And I say this because then some people have gotten a little, well, ma'am, you've done it. Well, okay, well, I hear what you're saying, so go ahead and, if you're going to write the ticket, go ahead and write the ticket. I do have an appointment, so as soon as you finish, you give it to me. I'll take care of it after that, whatever my disposition is going to be on it. But looking at the video allowed me to see that I can say exactly what I want to say and still be forcibly pulled from my vehicle, slammed to the ground, and then nobody knows what happened to me after that. Yes, and that is the reality that we are facing. I tell you, when I hear that, you know, from a sister, you know, it, it, it makes me a little bit emotional because I've been through, you know, the conversations with police officers. I've been detained, you know, I've been frisked. I've had the, you know, can we search? I've been through all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it upsets me, particularly, we mentioned this earlier, when we have this Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, I'm cool with Black Lives Matter. I don't have any issues with it one way or the other. But I do have an issue with All Lives Matter because I think it's outrageously offensive because it minimizes with the original point of what black lives matter. You don't see nobody running around a cancer walk talking about, well, see, some people got lupus. Right, you, exactly. You, you, you know what exactly. I mean? You don't, right. you, don't, you don't see that. You know, and I think that our lives are minimized because there isn't a whole lot of value that's placed upon them. Exactly. And when we look at, I ran through this, you know, some, just some general numbers last night on you know, Half Stepping with Marcus J. And since Michael Brown was murdered by Darren Wilson in, August of 2014, and, and my numbers are round figures. They're not. They're not the actual numbers. I, I don't have the study right in front of me. But there was approximately a thousand people, mm -hmm. a thousand people killed by the police in that one year span. Now that's somewhere around two and a half people a day, every day. Every day. Now half of them was white, mm -hmm. and then so you'll get some white folk who ain't really paying attention to numbers. Say, well, look, well, half of them was white. Yeah, but guess what? The other half wasn't white, and y'all are half the population. Some and black so people true. are two and a half times more yeah, likely right. to be the ones on the wrong side of the death. Right. And so what are we saying here? What, what are we talking about? That's what Black Lives Matter is all about. What's equally offensive really is, and I, I think I was sharing with uh, Pastor Carruthers, and I called the, the lion something other than um, Cecil, and I was sitting there saying, <laughs> I did. I think I called him like Cedric or something. <laughs> and I was like, and he said, who is Cedric? <laughs> the entertainer. <laughs> but I was sitting there thinking about how this massive outcry, and I you know, love lions and the whole nine yards. It's not a, a, a 
thing. I, I, I do. But I was so offended that Sandra Bland had died, and now here comes the distraction of this Once lion again. being killed. And then this dentist who's on the lam because every this is huge outrage. And now you've got to hunt him down and you want to find him and bring him to justice and there's nowhere he can hide. And then next thing you know, his brother was killed. Are you serious? Well, notice the symbolism, though. The symbolism is you don't matter. A lion matters yeah, more than more you than do. And someone do. actually did a cartoon of a black person. I saw it. In a lion costume. I saw it. <laughs> saying, do I matter now? Now do I matter? You know? And I mean, and it's <clears throat> ridiculous, but it's sad, but true. Yep. I mean, really, are you kidding me? Yep. And I mean, so then and I, I, I find America, but America okay, has always I been a, 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 a master a, of the bait and switch, so to speak. And uh, for example, while we were uh, seeking uh, justice for Mike Brown, Eric Garner flew right under the radar. That's exactly. how they, it was over with before we knew it because we were all paying attention to uh, Michael Brown and Ferguson. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And you were, and that, you were that was amazing uh, to me uh, to see that. But that's that's what America does. It's, it, and so even in the case of Sandra Bland, you know, it was much uh, as a metaphor, a pressure cooker building up. And so in order to take pressure out of that pot, we're going to... Uh, detour uh, this observation. We're going to shift it to this lion. You know what I mean? Right. Because and, it, and it's amazing to me uh, that they did that. You know, spiritually, because a lion would represent it. You know, you and I have talked before, and my brother, one of my favorite shows is the Lion King, because in the Lion King, you see how this lion comes and returns to himself and his rightful place in community as a protector and provider, et cetera, and so on. So it was very symbolic to me that America flipped out, the world flipped out when the Lion King got shot, whereas when the Lion Kings in our community get shot, there is no such okay. response. we got a green zone in Iran and a Red Sea on Martin Luther King Street. Do you know what I mean? Right. And so when exactly. I look at it like that, it's just amazing to me, as you said, and it just underscores it, that our life is considered less valuable than the lions. And keep in mind, you can hunt those legally. Right. Exactly. So and that was that my say point. About okay, he was a game hunter who you guys allowed into your country. You knew he was coming here to kill some lion. You didn't know that lion, but you gave him permission for his money to do that. But yet again, we talked about that. We touched briefly on it, on these distractions that come up when they want us to be not focused on what, what's at hand. Okay, so then we started focusing on, I mean, when you talk about when um, Trayvon Martin got killed, the ice challenge came up and everybody's running around dumping themselves with ice water. There's always some distraction to keep us off the task into the next Sandra Bland, into the next Michael Brown. You know, I said to Doc earlier, I said, okay, I know that people have still been on the ground in Ferguson, but we hadn't seen or heard anything from Ferguson at all until the anniversary of Michael Brown came up, and now the distraction is all of a sudden now riots have broken back out and things or whatever and stuff. Okay, well, I remember a year ago that you guys there pledged that you were going to work with the community, make a difference, bring up the jobs and all of the things that the people talked about. So that just let me know that when the cameras was off, you went right back to as business as usual, and now this powder keg is spilling over again. I have a question for you, and for, for anyone, because I've been really wrestling with this for the last couple of months. And, uh, again, uh, we have to be prophylactics in our community so that our children are not uh, contaminated by these spiritually transmitted diseases, uh, hatred being one of them. <clears throat> excuse me, hatred being one of them. But... I've been really wrestling with these silhouettes that they, uh, when you go to gun ranges, shoot at black targets. And I think that in terms of social justice, you know, and, and neuroscience, that it desensitizes people so that to see a black silhouette is not necessarily something that you would consider a life. This is something you're used to shooting anyway. Agreed. 
I'm one hundred percent with you. I talked ahead, about, I talked about that on my show a couple of months ago. And so you right on time. If you said you've been wrestling with this for a few months, then brother, yeah. you and I must have been kindred spirits and the melting of the minds without even knowing you because I'm telling you, that was something that we talked about on this show. And I think that it is very, very possible. Well, not even possible, it's likely mm -hmm. that that's what happens. And I would be surprised I would I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they see in police academies and things of that sort. Well also at there's there's a local um, place here that you can go and shoot in the range, and so I've been there, and you get an opportunity to choose, choose. what target you'd yep. like right. to shoot at. Exactly. And so I was on one particular lane, and I opted to shoot at circles, right, because I don't think it's a good idea to shoot at images of people. Right. Well, the couple next to me, a white couple, decided to choose the black um, silhouette that you all are talking about now. And so as the woman is shooting, and of course she doesn't really, not of course, but she wasn't very skilled, but as her husband began to shoot, she goes, shoot him in the eye, honey, shoot him in the eye. Shoot him in the eye? Yeah. Right. We're shooting paper, paper. aren't we? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Shoot point. him in the eye, honey. You're good, waiting good, for that day. Good point. And right. We, and so right. Exactly. Right. Bring your children in. Right. And children have the option with their parents to learn how to use weapons, and so they can either choose farm animals, they can choose anything that they want and you also bring out the these black, silhouettes. black silhouettes yep right yep. and doing some curating that, uh, uh, a couple of months back for a race summit i learned that they have silhouettes of black men running right and they're selling they're, selling they're these still at, at i know shows. that in georgia you know they were still using really? them up until recently um they they bought it out and then someone had actually um, did a story on it that they actually had the silhouette of a black man running and they shooting. One of the things that I wanted to um, talk about, um, just to go back a little bit, when we were talking about police officers, one of the things that Doc and I talked about is, okay, and, and I come from a long line of police officers, my brother-in-law is a police officer, so this is not a, a young lady that hates the police. Um, police, <laughs> big in my family. But one of the things that Doc and I was talking about is is that a lot of times uh, these officers are fresh out of the military, okay? Um, some of them have been on the job for a long, long period of time. And she raised a valid point, and you want to talk about that? Yeah, I did. I just asked the question. I wonder how many of these persons who are now um, on the force are, in fact, um, Veterans with PTSD, yeah. and one and how that plays out in their day to day walk. Oh, that's day. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I had a uh, I got a cousin that's a police officer uh, in my hometown of Jersey City, New Jersey, and I had a conversation with him, and he told me, you know, it's just a conversation between cousins, but he told me that his and he's a cop that his experience is that a lot of the cops is a bunch of punks who got beat up when they was in high school, and now they get to carry a gun, and, now, and they go and work in neighborhoods where they feel like they the man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of these cops is racist who have right. a badge who police in these neighborhoods of people of color. And, again, we're talking about the overseer thing. Right. And, we, and we were talking, too, and how many of these people have affiliations or memberships in clandestine organizations? Oh, we already know. Exactly. <laughs> we are, we and already so, know. Did you see uh, right. Django? So and all oh, of yes. pick my uniform or right. pull out my shirt? Samuel Jackson. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, 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 those are the police officers, you know, in many instances. You got some good ones, but a lot of ours, like you said, you know, it's uh, – it's, um, it's therapy for them, not an occupation. You well, know? I mean, we talk about Jim Crow, but you know what? Today we need to be dealing with James Crow Esquire. You right. know what I mean? Yeah, that's no, that's, his, no that's his more educated that's his, and more, right. you know, mm -hmm. stealth, you know, grandson. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the truth is, a lot of the folks who are wearing those white sheets on the weekends is wearing badges and, and robes. wearing robes and all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things during the week. During the and, week. you know, I, I'm no longer interested in worrying about what white people think about what I say. Right. And I'm no longer interested in worrying about black people who worry about what white people think about what we say. Right. Because right. I think we need to be more concerned with us and how we deal with things and a lot of times people get on me i mean they call me race baiter and all this stuff you should if i showed y'all some of the inboxes that i get from people mm -hmm. who've heard me say things mm -hmm. on legacy internet radio i don't care not no more i don't i don't care because the truth is if you shine the light on nonsense right. you're gonna always be a target right and, and if we have 
decided that we're going to walk this path, and that's what we're going to have to deal with. Exactly. No one, no one wants to make someone mad. We talked about that before, and these, talking about race is, is that tough, tough subject that nobody wants to talk about, but it exists. I watched a show um, like maybe two weeks ago, and they talked about white privilege. Okay. Um, Pastor Crothers, I'm going to have to let you go, hon. We have another caller, but please, give, if you get an opportunity, please call back, okay? Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Yes, hi. This is DeBar. I'm calling from New York. Hey, DeBar, nephew calling from New York. You listening in? Yes, I am, Auntie. How are you doing this evening? I'm fine, hon. What's your question or your comment, dear? Yeah, I just listening in, and um, as you mentioned, and you know, like, yeah, we have a lot of police officers in our family, and um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Go ahead, babe. We lost you for a minute. Yeah, my 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 question is, or rather, my comment is, um, like, I noticed, like, with everything that's going on, with the Robert touched on, um, as far as the police officers walking around in the sheets during the weekend and putting on a badge during the day. And, you know, they're conducting their business. Um, they're supposed to protect and serve. Um, my comment mostly is that with everything that's going on, you know, we have to understand or overstand that, yeah, all police officers aren't bad, even the white ones. Um, but when you are a police officer and you're trying to make a difference and prime example would be um um the movie with Denzel Washington American Gangster when a police officer they found all that money and then he turned it in he did the right thing he was ostracized right and I think a lot of times a lot of the officers the white officers want to step up and say hey this is not right but they have fear of being ostracized by their brothers in the police force um in the community and everything, and I guess my question would be is how, as um, African Americans or just the, the typical citizen in America, how do we go about to show our support for these officers to let them know, hey, listen, we need you to speak up because you're inside the loop. We need you to speak up. How do we get the them to have the courage to speak up? How do we support them? Good question. Marcus? Well, I, the way I look at that, it's, I hope I'm not going in a big circle, you know, to, to give you a direct answer. But I think if we are to assume that all cops aren't bad, I'm going to need the cops to assume that all brothers ain't up to no good. Right. And it needs to be, right. it needs to be reciprocal. Um, you know, I, you, you call him from New York. I just saw a video literally as we're sitting here doing a show of a brother standing in a store in New York City and the cops just roll up on him and beat him down. You know, so if I'm constantly seeing those images, just like they're constantly seeing images of brothers acting crazy, somebody has to stop and say, you know what, let's stop, let's think, let's give certain folks the benefit of the doubt. The unfortunate reality is I, because of my experience and because of the experience of people who look like me and what I've seen, they're not willing to do that for me. Right. And so I understand, brother, the question, the question is, if we know that most of them aren't dirty, how can we support the ones that do? Well, the first thing, I need to see them ostracize the dirty cops right. instead of always protecting them. That's the first thing. Perfect. When we see police officers basically with sovereign immunity, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, know, you, 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 you do yes, these yes. things and, and you don't even get charged. But then when you talk about the Blue Shield and how um, the Blue Shield closes in and they protect their own, and so then what you end up looking at, and this is what I was going to, to share um, right in line with uh, what Brother Marcus Jay is saying, is that those officers who are there to protect, who are there to serve, who do lay their, down their lives every day, um, for the good of society, all of those, um, regardless of race, creed, color, or gender, right? So you can support all of them, but they have to be the ones to stand up against those who are not. And they have to be the ones to say, we're not going to tolerate this on the force. And that has to go all the way up to the top. The mayors has got, have got to say that we won't tolerate this. And then they have to turn in those folks that they know are either on the take or those that they know are just running around town roughhousing, beating up people and killing people with, Im with immunity. 
I think it, I think um, also to bar it, that it even goes much deeper than that. I think that the protocol for police need to be re-looked at and reevaluated. You have to understand that once again, the protocol that was outlined for them did not include us. It didn't include us as a people, just like the Constitution didn't include us as a people. If you look at the whole outline of police, African American were never ever considered to ever be able to be police officers. Most of your police officers were white Irish Americans, okay, which was a mob in their own self. So we infiltrated exactly. this thing and the protocols did not change. Um, dialogue did not change. No one is sitting these people in a classroom and teaching them tolerance. No one is sitting them in a classroom. They're graduating from the academy as rookies and being thrown out into the street, going into neighborhoods that some of them have never ever been with. Some of them have never dealt with African American people in their life until they got into the academy or until they were old enough, like Marcus J said, to go to college and to experience, you know what I'm saying? And that's black and white police officers. Okay, you know, coming from where we did, where we are from, we know as children what neighborhoods we can go into, what neighborhoods we can't go into, what neighborhoods you may be welcome in from 9 to 5, but by sundown you better be out of that neighborhood. Okay? That's These right. are things that we know as New Yorkers and as children that Doc knows from being up in Northern right. Virginia and Marcus may know from his neighborhood, but no one is sitting at the table and putting all of this stuff on the table. No one wants to talk about it. The other thing about that is no one wants to talk about white privilege. I said it, white privilege. It does exist. And you can buy into white privilege as a black person if you have an American Express black car like Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, and no, all of them. I they become that, those. They become the good ones, the acceptable I ones. If yeah, and, and, I, and I would just like to. You also see. I would just like to add on to that, and right, and and issues. as a valid point, uh, I think a lot of black folks we became so content with this um, quote unquote equality, yet we have no political equality, we have no financial equality, exactly. and people are content with that. And uh, and just to to piggyback, you know, to go back with the police, you know, I have another question. Um, I, in my opinion, I believe that that's one of the toughest jobs to have. Um, they do have one of the highest alcoholic rates so far as drug abuse, um, domestic violence abuse, the highest divorce rate. I wonder why there aren't more programs in place to kind of check them mentally because, like you said, these are people that come out in the hood. The only perception or reality they have of black people is what they see on TV, and they don't make the black man look good at all. And the black woman is even objectified as a sept object, mm -hmm. whereas she's only good for the white man in the back for him to cheat on his wife with the black woman. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we see that all the time on TV. So, yeah, and, and I live in a community where, you know, it's a mixed, but, you know, I'm around white folk and all that. And a lot of them, you know, it's the adults. The adults will look at you crazy, but I see so many little white children, and they don't look at the color. Kids will it's play. A, it's a, Kids, it's a it's toy. Right. Learn children, things, it's not you know. until they get older yep. and when they start to um, be indoctrinated into racist behavior, and then when one day the scales come off their eyes and they realize they have privilege. Yep. Right. Yep. I mean, and, I look at my right. own child, you know, my, my beautiful little chocolate baby. She's got three friends. One is just as chocolate as she is. Then there's one that's half chocolate, half vanilla. And then there's one that's completely vanilla. Mm -hmm. And I, I said that kind of in a silly way. But, but to make mm -hmm. the point, you, you, when you watch the four of them kick it, you can't tell unless you got eyes. Mm -hmm. Which one's white, which one's black. Well, they they're, all, just friends. they're just, just friends. friends. They're just friends. And I, and I, I just I love to watch them right. because they represent that purity that hopefully they'll be able to keep because that's what we need. We need people to be able to understand each other so that they can go back to their crew and say, all right, this is where we messed up. Because that's the, the thing is, it's not that, for example, we don't need women to say things um, like don't rape women, right, because we know don't we do it. We need men to say, say don't, don't rape, rape women. women. Yep. We 
are saying Black Lives Matter, but we need to. Debar, thanks people. for calling, hun. We got another call. We need white people to say Black Lives Matter. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Thanks for calling. Hello, this is the one and only Mr. LP. Stephen Sykes, how y'all doing today? Hi, Mr. LP. We're not worthy. What's up, Stephen? What's up? Hey, I'm doing all right. I uh, just wanted uh, to say thank you very much for I had a chance for joining in on the show. Um, and things that didn't bring about such a uh, very important and needy topic. Uh, I want to say, unfortunately, yes, we live in a society that, you know, is more so go back in front of each other. I have been I meant to say one time is that uh, what a lot of people don't know, for example, like they will say, oh, well, we expected you because of how I act, uh, that oh, it's okay for you to go ahead to UVA because of how you are, because you're not, quote, unquote, one of us. I applied to all schools, um, major predominantly white, predominantly black. I was told by, I didn't get, oddly enough, I didn't get accepted to about seven or eight of the uh, black colleges I applied to, which I found was interesting. When I went to ask one of them, they told me, well, you don't seem like you need the black experience, right, because you don't seem like you're one of us. You act to, you're not one of us. Because my name says Stephen Sykes, because I acted a certain way, because I didn't have this, edge or whatever is street about me. And I thought that very distasteful that, you know, black people can't come in all shapes and colors, that you're falling into the image of what we are supposed to be. And that's what happens. Uh, that that's very sad. I wanted to let y'all know that me and my father had a good debate here, that um, my father's along with Marcus about that, you know, immigration is one of the worst things we've ever had, where I'm always saying that integration um, without uh, assimilation, that, you know, we became lazy and we should have had safeguards. And then the last thing that you mentioned about inequality, we're fighting so much about equality that we're forgetting certain things. When you do get it, okay, to a point, uh, what are you doing with it? Such as when we had the housing issues for a while, Bank of America and a whole many other people with the, with the predator loans, but did not have the tools, nor did we go out and try to get the tools to understand what we needed in terms of protecting ourselves. So that's something out there. I just wanted to bring a point, and I'll get off the phone. I but think, I appreciate no, all of you very much. Us for, hang out with us for a minute. But, I mean, I agree with you um, to that extent. I think the other thing, um, like um, one of the things that I heard and that I wanted to say, and even when I talk to you all of the time, is is that we also have to stop being prejudiced against each other. We can't eliminate the stigma of racism, we're prejudiced against each other. I think Spike Lee did a great job when he wrote School Days, when he did the, the jigaboos and the good and bad hair and the dark skin versus light skin. We've allowed people to tell us what black is beautiful is. We've allowed our natural hair care sisters to be ostracized because they decided to go natural and now that it's become a fashion trend that some of our other sisters want to go, now it's okay. So we have to start fixing these things internally first before we can even begin to go. We have to be honest with each other. We talk about each other. We'll look, I had a, a meeting a couple of days ago with um, my sister group and we were talking and we said one of the things that we will do is as women, we will look at another sister and instead of lifting her up, we will tear her down. We've made it okay to be a thought. We've made it okay to be itches. We've made it okay to be all of the things that we get mad when other people say them and then justify it stupidly by going, well, that's my girl. Oh, that's I could hear one thing on the top of it is that the fact that we live in a society that uh, exploits hyper-masculinity, which I was talking about right. on another show, that, you know, and especially in our minority cultures where, you know, many of our Asian American uh, is stereotyped as martial arts artists and drugs, uh, similar to Middle Eastern and, of course, of us that we're just into sports, hitting on women and, um, you know, the drug game. And if you show any type of emotion, affection, or anything of that nature, you're deemed as you're not weak and you're not strong. Whereas if you have plenty of good men who want to be ahead and do the things and be that strong leader and don't mind crying, but because they're put down by their peers, we talk about we don't that, support that man them up or anything else, we're treated them as if they're bad. Right. And that's something that we need to start showing our brothers and sisters that it's okay for men and to be emotional and, and show it in a proper way right. through support, through love, not just because of somebody dies. Pastor Crosler said something that was really, really key, and when you were talking, I was thinking about it. Let's go back to this trauma, okay, because 
not only is it traumatic with some of the things that we see, obviously the killing and the murder. You know, I, I've worked in public housing. I've seen murders and children dragged up and down the sidewalk for group fights and things of that. But it's also traumatic to go to the refrigerator and there's no food in it. It's also traumatic to watch your mother crying because she can't get you school clothes and all of the other things. So, again, when Doc was saying about this restoration of the village, because I came from a village that if you didn't have, so-and-so had the bread, you had the mayonnaise, I had the meat, all of our kids ate. Okay, it was it, it was unheard of that someone would tell you that your child was up the street doing something. There's things happening in our community now that is at an all time high that I won't say didn't happen because some things did happen, but it wasn't happening the way it is now with our children. We have children missing and no one's talking about them, but we are still talking about little Ethan Pates, I remember the little white boy, I remember when he got abducted in 1970-something. Let me. Can I speak to that? Uh, Ethan Potts is the reason why every single week on my show I profile a missing and, ex okay. and or exploited black child. Mm -hmm. Because I am the same age as Ethan Potts and I remember right. when he vanished. When he vanished. And I remember how it affected me because of the media made right. sure that we never stopped seeing it. And then Adam Walsh and Atlanta Child Murders mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And I so, so, so agree with you. That's why I do it. Because I know nobody else is doing it. Nobody cares or about it. Or if you think about it, there was a show that had a short life on TV. Find Our Missing. Find Our Missing. That's right. And it disappeared. But we protest to get the game back on TV. Yep. Hello. Yep. We're so talking about me quitting the Real Housewives. And we come back to the question. Hey, Stephen, we got we got a we got a bad connection with you, Stephen. Do something with you, like maybe move or something. Can you hear me better now? That's yes, better. Yeah, can. yeah. I said I was one of the major things I've said a long time that we fought to get the game or girlfriends or what have you. But uh, or just any of our shows that is better. But then when Friends was on or anything else, they got out there by the millions and to get that back on. Or look at Community. When that show went off, they got nine per million emails sent to get into Netflix to get that show on there. But we can't fight to get a show like that that's much more um, important. I give you another issue. We talk about uh, the mention with one of the shows me, uh, me and Marcus always talk about sometimes. Time is about our adoption rate. Uh, it's bad all around, but especially bad when it comes to us. And the only time it's quote unquote okay now because you have celebrities that do actually care and have a black, black children. So now it's quote unquote, unfortunately, it's looked at as a fashion trend versus an actual need um, when there's a cause for it. Um, and I remember uh, Charlize Theron saying that, that she wished more people would come out and state that this is an issue not just because you see a few people you want to think it's a popularity statement. Right. And we need to do more to uh, make awareness regarding that in our communities as well. Agreed, Doc. Well, one of the things that I often say about um, even dealing with adoption, and we have um, in our community one church, one child, and so a lot of churches are involved in this, but we're not adopting our own children. And when we see the celebrities, most of the time, they're not adopting black children from America. They're leaving the country and they're taking children that are um, African children or from other countries and bringing them here. And so then they're uh, missing out on what uh, culture and language and people and customs. Um, you have Madonna using the N-word as it relates to her children on Twitter, but then she takes it off real quickly. Um, you've had instances where people have adopted their children, and because this is their child now, if I put this child to work, it is my child. It is not um, a quote-unquote slave. If I have them uh, sleeping in in the basement, if I have them working on the farm, if I have them Remember taking care of menial about the tasks. Lady that was exactly. Had sleeping at her feet and rubbing the child like a dog. Exactly. And so this is my child that I have adopted. So legally, I can do with this child as I please. So I have my own thoughts and feelings about these various adoptions. But again, as black people, if we are not adopting our own children, then um, there's much to be said. And what about black culture matters? Because one of the things at coming from uh, my grandmother was big into foster care. And one of the things that's ironic is, is that 
rarely, unless they hold some form of celebrity, okay, can a black person adopt a white child. The uproar is always, oh, they won't know about their culture, they won't be able mm -hmm. to, to relate or whatever. But a white person can adopt a black child, and there's no measures put into place to make sure that culturally that child gets things poured into them that only another African American person so can do tell. Black lives matter. I would I would actually argue that it would be easier. Point well taken. Here's the question: So do black lives matter? I, not not to anybody that's not black, but I, I, I would I, I would argue that it would be easier for a black couple to raise a white child than it would be for a white couple to raise a black child. I would, I would make a very strong that. argument. I would support that argument. Yeah, I mean, and so, you know, we live in a whitewashed world. So we already know how to raise a white kid. The average middle class black family knows how to raise a white kid. I mean, tell the truth, shame the devil, we were doing it. Yeah. Let's talk about Mammy and everybody else that was rearing their yeah. children. Say word. Like, Hello, make me want to holler, throw up my hands. Yeah, okay. Let me add this, and we were talking. Just yeah, or even um, better, it's easier. What's even worse is easier to adopt a child, a black child from another country, than getting one here in America. Right. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Which if is you travel sad. internationally, you will see um, airplanes full of people coming back from different countries, Ethiopia, from. Um, the continent of Africa, just coming back with children, babies, infants, um, newborns. I mean, it's just, uh, it's almost sad um, when you see them just holding the babies as if they are animals or accessories. Um, one thing I just want to make note of when we were talking before about growing up and having uh, white friends and all those kinds of things, on Facebook, one of my friends from elementary school put out a question asking which one of you thinks that you are my oldest friend and all of and she's a, a white young lady and so all of her friends put in there you know I've known you since high school I've known you since middle school so I'm definitely your oldest friend and I didn't respond to it but I knew that out of all the people that were responding she and I have known each other the longest so I waited to see who she would identify as her oldest friend and she came back, she says, no, none of you, because she and I have been friends since kindergarten, and friends since kindergarten. And I remember the, the, the time that there started to be a little bit of a, a break was in middle school, mm -hmm. when you started to gravitate toward people who look more like you, mm -hmm. who talk like you from your neighborhood more. And then even in high school, we still were friends, and even now as adults, but I could tell at that age where something shifted for us but um do, do you because um, i'm mm -hmm. intrigued by that mm -hmm. because i have a daughter who very possibly could be experiencing that in the mm -hmm. next few years mm -hmm. do you find that that shift was reciprocal i think that um yes i think that what happened was by us uh, being in middle school and we were both on the cheerleading team and all those things, she started to gravitate toward white people, and I started gravitating toward mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. And so the times that we would spend together were fewer and farther between, unless there was a whole group of us all doing things. But when we were children, our parents would take us to each other's houses. We didn't live in the same neighborhood. And it was like Tracy said, I could go over there. I mean. Things to me like... Um, so your parents supported your friendship? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And yes. still do. Yes. Still do. Yeah. Well, that's, that's key. Uh, and that, so the, the parents yeah. have yeah, to I'll be the continue ones. On with your, uh, continue on with the show. I'll be listening in, but I thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank LP. You, Thanks, Mr. brother. Be cool, Stephen. Be cool, man. Yeah. Thanks for letting me thank do you. this. Peace. Absolutely. I think that I know that we covered so much today. I hope that my hope is whenever I have the opportunity to be able to educate, enlighten, and open up some form of dialogue that even where people can just start talking amongst their friends right. and their associates or whatever. And then there's the responsibility, like we talked earlier. There's always this talented tenth, so to speak, and those of us um, who are in the community who have resources, and I say us because I'm believing that there's going to be a time where I'm going to have some resources. But for those of us who have um, these resources, whatever they are that we can bring to bear, we have to bring it to the table have and to. have to use it for the betterment of our folks. So if the strong have to bear the infirmities of the weak, then that's what we have to do in order for us to get out of this place that you talked about. Um, 
and see the, the light, so to speak, and then get to it. We all have to do it together. Marcus. I agree. I think that it's important um, that we support each other. I, I just think that it's absolutely key that we, that we do that. Go ahead, Carla. You're on the air. Thanks for calling. Hello, Carla, you there? We lost him as quick as we got him. Sorry, Carla. <laughs> if you um, please call back, 804-402-2893 um, as we wind down. We still are able to take your calls, so just give us a call, Marcus, you were saying? No, I was just going to say, you know, I think that it's, it's imperative that we support each other. Uh, we support each other in all endeavors. We support each other, uh, and we give constructive criticism when necessary, but we praise when necessary as well. Go ahead, caller. Thanks for calling back. You're on the air. Yes, yeah, it's RTSB again. I just wanted to um, comment on with the... Uh, the the queen said about far as the 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 community um, getting together and um, putting together our resources, combining our resources. Because um, uh, on my spare time, what I do, I do a lot of online studying, research. Um, most of the time, maybe three, four, five hours a day. Everything from politics to religion to spirituality to our African culture. Um, everything and what I noticed my resource is is actually that I am very good at forensics research so I dig in the crates I get information a lot of times I'll post it on Facebook a lot of times I don't because it's so ignorant there and I always find myself defending myself versus um, the person in, in, in question may want to have dialogue, but it turns out that they're arguing me down. And versus us combining our resources, we don't come to a common ground. And I think that's the problem with the African-American community is that, you know what, not for nothing, too many of us know it all and we don't know nothing at all. And then we don't listen to our elders. So nowadays... I'm a little skeptical to walk up to a young man and tell him, hey, man, do you know why you're wearing your pants down like that? Do you know where that started? Do you know what this is all about? And then, you know, and then when you tell him, or you can't even tell him, you know, I'll be afraid to, you know, to get hurt or, you know, or, or worse than that, you know, get disrespected in a sense, whereas, you know, here it is, one brother to another brother telling you something, and I just don't understand why it takes for a European man to tell a black man, or a black woman, what they need to do for themselves. Exactly. If and we were to just combine our resources and our intellects and sit there and brainstorm, we will understand that every science, every science, um, anything that you can name of, it originated from us. And we have to get back to that essence of who we are as of uh, people, you know, find ourselves to actually find out what our resources are that we offer to the community because so many of us have so many gifts but yet we use it the wrong way mm -hmm. and we're just like walking out here dumb deaf and blind so that's, I, I definitely agree with the point when she said you know we got to put our resources together and, that's and get it going point. that's a good point to bar thanks for calling back we're winding down we're going to respond to that and then we're going to allow um dr burton to take us out within the spirit but we appreciate you we appreciate I know what you do out there in New York, and thank you for listening in. I appreciate you. Love you. Yeah, and, and I want to thank you all for having this type of forum because we do need this more in the community. And now that I know that this is what y'all do, I'm going to stay tuned, and um, whatever I can do to kind of um, shed some information that I may gather, I will definitely pass it on. And with that, I'm going to say peace. Peace. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you for checking us out, and, man. And, Legacy and, in that radio. Pull up the website. Take a look at our website and keep in touch with me. You'll see how to do that on there. www.legacyinternetradio.com. You, you got like, it. You I'm like, already you, on it. I'm sound, on it. You sound like Thank a, you. You sound like a brother that I need to be connected with. So I'm serious when I say that. Yes, I will. I will definitely, brother. All right, brother. Be cool. I think um, it, he raised a good point. I think one of the things is. In any good relationship, you have to have trust. And somewhere along the line, we lost trust for each other. We lost respect for each other. Remember, Doc, we talked about on other shows where if Miss Jones seen you up the street, 
and Ms. Jones came down and told your mother you was doing something, your mother did not look at Ms. Jones and want to fight Ms. Jones. She was like, and you, you didn't text that behind before you got down here? Now you knock on somebody's door, he raised a good point, or you try to educate them and tell them, you get that, I don't care, I don't care. Well, I want to thank Mr. LP for letting me sit in with him. Marcus, you have been the man. I've had a ball. But when we do our sister to sister grind, one of the things that I always go, we can't open this up without giving you something to get through the rest of the week. So I'm going to ask Doc to give us something within the spirit. All right. So I want to say thank you also. Marcus J., just fantastic. Thank you. Many, many blessings to you and to my sister Tracy, to Reverend Carruthers, who's called in, and to all the other callers, and to Mr. LP. Thank you so much just for an opportunity to sit in your space tonight. As we prepare to leave this place and prepare to kind of get our hearts centered around a common thought or a thing, um, the African phrase, Ubuntu, it means I am because you are. The white Western way is, I think, therefore I am, right? And it's an individualistic kind of way. Our way is a community way. Our way is a village way. And it takes an entire village not only to raise a child, but it takes a village to know who you are because you are a part of something so much greater than you. And in our home, we have a house rule. The house rule is everybody has got to come home which means that your life is not just your own. You are accountable to some people. We need you in the village. We need what you bring. You don't have the right to be careless with your life. You don't have a right to do anything that would jeopardize your coming back home to us. And so I wanna say to all of us, us as family, do whatever you've got to do to make sure you make it home safely because we need you. We need your spirit. We need your gifts. We need the education that you bring. We need our elders. We need our babies. We need our third graders. We need everybody pulling in the same direction. And so if we can just get this spirit of Ubuntu, I am because you are. I don't understand myself without being in community with you. If we can get that back into our spirit, get that down on the inside of us, and all pull together in the same direction. That's how we're going to move forward. Marcus J., I couldn't have said it. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm humbled by those words because, you know, they're so prophetic and they're so uh, on point to what we are going through in our individual homes as well as in our community home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just come home, man. That That's, that's powerful. Yeah. And uh, I hope that, anyone that's listening takes that to heart because it basically sums up the entire discussion that we've been having from the time we started. So mm -hmm. I thank you, my sister, Bless for you. that. Thank you, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you've been listening to Legacy Internet Radio, alive in with Mr. LP, who will be back next Tuesday unless we abduct him and lock him in a closet and take over his show again. <laughs> I thank him again for the opportunity. This has been your girl, Silk. Good night. Good night. Good We're going to run this back. So if you're listening and you missed anything, stay tuned. We're going to run this whole show back immediately following uh, this walk out here. So we appreciate it. Live and radio, we're gone.